one. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another session, episode, episodic moment of A Real Point of View. I'm your host, Greg Morgan, and I'm also the real movie guy. And joining me is my lovely co-host, the movie maven herself, Miss Karen D. What's going on, Karen? Um, everything's copacetic, Greg. No, right? <laughs> <laughs> so pathetic. I haven't heard that word in a long time. Yeah, I know. I just I had to dig deep for that one. What can I tell you? Well, you, you did. You said copacetic. That tells me so much. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, everything is everything's cool on my end. And that's probably an old term too. So just kind of mm -hmm. going with it, right? Well, today's episode, ladies and gentlemen, is talking about a actor who I think when I first saw him in this particular movie that I enjoyed, um, came across as I thought just he felt authentic. And then another movie I saw him in made me realize that this guy is one of the better method actors out there. Um, and the subject of our conversation today is Daniel Day Lewis, the retired Sir Daniel Dave Lewis. So, first of all, I was shocked, Karen, when he said he was retiring from acting. And I'm not saying he's just a young, young man, but he's not that old either. So, what was that about? What do you think that was about? I mean, I guess there comes a time in people's lives where they want to, you know, kind of relax maybe and, and, and enjoy the rest of their lives. But yeah, you know, such a good actor, man. It just, that was tough. Well, he's 63 now. Yeah. So he's not that old, but he's also not that young either. Right. Lord knows he doesn't need the money. And I, I, he won't say, he won't say why. I mean, the, the, the reason why is extremely closely held. Probably I wouldn't be surprised if, if only like his very closest friends and maybe his wife and sons, and that might be it, um, might know um, as to why. I just, I just hope it's not health related. You know, I just, yeah. I really hope that he is doing well, um, you know, health wise. Um, and I haven't heard any, I haven't heard or seen anything to indicate that there is a health issue at all, mm -hmm. but, um, but at the same time, I mean, I was wondering about that myself, the same, same thing that you were, Greg, what was behind this retirement? Because it, it did come as quite a shock. I mean, remember 2017, after he did Phantom Thread, he announced that he was retiring. Um, and it's like, whoa. And it was, that was the shot heard around the world, literally. Right. Um, but it's not it's not clear why. And when you look at his filmography, um, he actually does have a film um, that's that's newer than that. He did Phantom Thread in 2017, but he well, then he did something called For the Hungry Boy in 2018. And, but that's connected to Phantom Thread. So I don't know, I don't know what that's about. Um, mm -hmm. um, so I guess generally speaking, I would say that he, you know, but some people are like, well, he'll be back because he'll get bored, yeah. he'll get tired. In much the same way that Garth Brooks came back after he retired. Mm -hmm. You know, but Garth Brooks was much younger when he retired. I think when he announced his retirement, maybe, I think he was in his 40s. Yeah, he was in his 40s, yeah. Right. So he was in his 40s and it's like, well, okay, it's not about, it stopped being about money like, you know, 20 years ago for you because, you know, you're such a consummate artist. It's not, you don't need the money, but I would think you'd want to keep creating and why, you know, what happened? And, you know, and he needed an extended break, I guess, because after about, you know, 15 years, he came back. Right. And it's still going strong. Yep. Right. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. But anyway, um, he, he is quite an actor. You know, he's an amazing actor. And it's not that he, 
remember how we did when we did our show on James Hong and mm -hmm. over 600 credits right to his name well Daniel Day Lewis is the exact opposite of James Hong mm -hmm. he's got he's got like 30 film credits and right. that's it All right well, you well, know I guess that comes out to to the between quantity and quality right well, I don't know about that, but, but I mean, in, in, in general, he's had some not as many movies, but a lot of his movies are pretty decent. Right. Um, yeah, I, I guess if you put it that way, but I, I guess I thought you were saying that James Hong was more quant quantity no. than quality. And no, no I wouldn't. Say I wasn't really. Uh, yeah, I wasn't referring to James Hong directly at all. I was just oh, saying okay. in the midst of, of not having so many for Daniel Day Lewis as far as quantity for him. I said, well, it might not be quality. I mean, quantity, but maybe the quality is the reason why. Maybe that's just it. Putting so much of yourself into a work is in itself daunting and tiresome. And, and, and maybe that's it. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe putting so much of yourself so that your characters are believable, so that your characters are viable. That, that takes a little bit out of you. I think it takes a lot out of you. And I think that's, I mean, I think really that's what's going on. That's why it's, you know, it's like five years in between roles or more than that. And, um, and he, he does take method acting. I mean, he's like the method actor's method actor. He's right. so method. Um, and he's, you know, he's famous for, he's famous for that, mm -hmm. but the obsessiveness with which he creates this world, he literally throws himself into this whole world of whatever character he's playing and it's all enveloping, it's all engrossing, it's incredibly intense. And he allows nothing to interfere with that. And some yeah. people who are who are considered consummate actors don't necessarily do that. You know, mm -hmm. they they don't approach the, their roles in the same way. And they may do they may do a lot more work. I mean, Denzel Washington has twice as many credits as Daniel Day Lewis does. Um, Daniel Day Lewis has more Academy Awards, um, but but I would say that they are both great actors. But Denzel Washington doesn't have the reputation for this world creation kind of thing, except in isolated instances. Whereas mm -hmm. with Daniel Day Lewis, that's something that you know you're getting. If he's attached, then you know he's going to then you know just get used to calling him by his character name on the set and get used to him doing you know character driven bizarro things you know during a lunch hour you know after you go home for the evening um and you happen to run into him and it's like well no he's he's not in a car because this character wouldn't be in a car he's going home on horseback just yeah, gotta go I, with I, it I, I, yeah, I, I saw a thing, uh, read something about Spielberg saying that um, when he was doing Lincoln, um, that even the people on the set who other actors who happen to be British, he asked that they not speak in their native tongue when they're on break because it would hurt his feeling about his character. And he, if he's going to say, be this uh, uh, Illinois uh quote unquote president of the United States back in the Civil War. He wants everybody to be Civil War likey <laughs> during the situation and not say, oh yes, Chapman. No. No, there's no English British here. This is American, not English. So it's, you know. Right. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Interesting's a word. Um it's I mean as another actor, I don't know that I mean, for my process, I may need to take a break. Right. You know, like I may not, need- so not to I lose yourself? 
Right. I may need to step back just for my own sanity. Right. So having to adhere to Daniel Day Lewis's requirements for, you know, his work process completely ignores my process, which may be entirely different than his, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I mean, you know, so I don't know, but then, you know, he's the star and if you're the supporting player, you, you do as you're asked or they'll find another supporting player. You can be replaced. He cannot. So there you go. There you go. There you go. Um, in Phantom Thread, um, the woman who played um, Alma and Vicky Creep. Cripes. I'm not sure how. Um, I'm not sure how her name is pronounced. Mm -hmm. um, come on. Um, but I'll just say Vicky Cripes. But she played Alma, who was the muse, mm -hmm. and his love interest in the film. And he played Reynolds Wood Woodcock. Um, mm -hmm. the, of the House of Woodcock and the, 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 the head designer. Designer, yeah. And she had to refer to him as Reynolds. Not, not just while they were shooting, not just during breaks, but if she ran into him, you know, in front of, I don't know, Herod's on the street in the, you know, while they were filming, but it could have been a day off, she still needed to refer to him as Reynolds not Daniel. He was not Daniel ever. But isn't that kind of ironic because say the movie's over and you finish filming and you walk down the street and you yourself have adapted to the requirements of the previous film, calling him Reynolds. And then, you know, she says, oh, hey Reynolds. He says, why are you calling? We've done the movie's over. You call me Daniel. She's like, look, you need to either Make a decision, Mister. As I'm going to tell you. <laughs> right, right. And you've got all these people calling him different names. The guy's got twenty names, thirty names. He's been thirty films. He's got thirty names. We're all thirty <laughs> personalities. So there you go. Thirty-one, and and everyone's still looking. It's kind of like trying to find Waldo. Everyone's looking for Danny. Hey, Daniel. Where's Daniel? He said, "Well, I don't know, because that was thirty characters ago." Right. That's, right. that would but be it's so just, hilarious. It's just, it's just, you know, anyway, I mean, as somebody who, you know, I mean, used, used to be an actor, and know I have my own specific process for trying to internalize a character, or trying to create a life for my character. And one of the things that I would do is sort of like crack wise as my character, you know, um, that just sort of made me feel more comfortable, but I had to be careful about how I did that because you didn't want to insult the writer, you didn't want to insult the director. They may not understand this, you know, what I'm doing with that, but that that was something that I would do. And, but I can, but I'm thinking like none of, you know, I've, of course, I've never acted on that level. So the place that I've been in, the, television or movie sets I've been on, I've never been with anybody who said, you know, I'm inhabiting this character. And so we need to make sure that I'm, you know, we need to refer to me as that character. You need to treat me as if I'm that character the entire time, day off, day on, lunch time, break time, bathroom time. I don't care what time it is. I'm that character. Never had that. And I don't know how I would have responded to that. Because that, I mean, in, to me, that comes off as pretty stressful to me. Sure. Um, you know, um, because I mean, like when you look at, you know, some of the information about Daniel Day-Lewis, I mean, like he was in, you know, when he was in the boxer, well, he learned to box, right. you know, and quite adeptly as it turned out. Or like when he was doing Last of the Mohicans, he learned how to shoot, you know, those A kinds musket, of firearms, yeah. Yeah. muskets. 
he really, really learned. And, you know, at lunchtime, he, he'd be like sharpening a knife or cleaning a gun, you know, while, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. Um, is that a musket in your pocket or are you just happy to see me? Uh, you know. No, it's a musket. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, um, can we just like, can we just like dial back? <laughs> no. <laughs> like I would like to survive after the Mohicans. <laughs> right. So can you? <laughs> <laughs> um and you know of course if i said something like that i, I would have been escorted off the set i so say you, not mohegan new yorker so you put the musket down you know? <laughs> right 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 and of course you know well mr mr mohegan doesn't appreciate your sense of humor so we'll just be escorting you off the set right now right, right. you'll never work in this town again so <laughs> you don't say daddy bobo you're out <laughs> right <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So, I don't <laughs> who's know what Hawkeye? Do. What do you mean, who's Hawkeye? <laughs> okay, anyway. But just, you know, ext- I mean, I mean, this puts a whole new meaning to the word intense. Yeah. I'm just saying, you know. All right, all right. And so, I don't, but I, but then again, you know, as an actor, you kind of, you never know what you're getting when, um, from my limited experience, I would say I, I did try to each approach each project with the people in the project with an open mind. I just didn't come with any judgments about who I was going to be with until they showed in no uncertain terms who they were. And so you can kind of discover ways of working or things to do that you didn't know you could do. Um, so that is, that would be the upside of working with somebody like that. Like you, you, you know, if you if you don't close off that way of working, then you may find okay, well, this might be, this is different, but I'll just go along for the ride and see where it takes me. Yeah, I, I guess that's true, and I guess, in 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 one aspect, you're thinking, well, you. You don't really want to fault anybody for, for working so hard to to hone their skills so much so that again the person that you're portraying is believable. And I think as a as a viewer of film, I want to believe what I'm watching. Now I realize things are fiction. I realize things can, are can be fantasy and fantastic. But even in the realms of that, I still want to be. Um, uh, convinced that the person I'm watching or in, in the scene that they're in makes sense and it makes more sense if the person is invested in the character that they're playing and I obviously being so intense um, has its reward especially for those of us who are viewing it um, now obviously as you as you alluded to it can also be very harrowing trying to put portray such a uh, uh, reliably uh, believable person, character. And I guess as an actor, you take on that onus to try to, to be that for whoever's going to be watching so that they can be, you know, for the whole purpose of enjoying the film, enjoying the art of the film, especially depending on what the, the subject matter is and what the film is. So uh, I appreciate that. But wow, I just always thought it's just, in his case especially, it's just a lot of work. And not saying that others don't work, and it's not hard for others too, but just putting even right. that much more into it can be in itself um, pretty exhausting. Right, which is why he's only got 30 film credits to his name, you know, and, it, and it's years in between, um, in between roles. And he turns down he's turned down in his career quite a few roles. Mm -hmm. Um, And he's um, been considered for some roles and then uh, roles went to other people. So, you know, I I don't know. It's just, it's, it's interesting. I mean, to me, just thinking about his process is exhausting as far as I'm concerned. 
And I think for his, for the people who act with him, I mean, of course, you know, somebody comes to you and says, hey, you know, nascent actor, or hey, you know, person who's not nearly as famous as Daniel Day-Lewis, how'd you like to work with Daniel Day-Lewis? I mean, what are you going to say? No. That's like saying, how would, how would you like, you know, you've only got one arm, how would you like two arms? Well, why, yes, please, I would like that. Or, you know, gee, you only have five cents to your name, how would you like $5 million? Why, I think I would like that very much. So you know, it's not like you're going to say no, what are you, nuts? So you're going to say yes. But you just, but then, you know, you, you do, you, you better go all in. That's all I, I mean, like Vicki Kripes had, had never met Daniel Day Lewis until the first day of filming for Phantom Thread. And, she, but she was told before they ever met, uh, call him Reynolds, Reynolds or Mr. Woodcock or whatever, but don't do whatever you do. Don't call him Danny. Don't call him Daniel. Don't call him Day Lewis. Don't mention any words that even begin with D because his name is Reynolds Woodcock. So just call him Reynolds and leave it at that. That's, that's amazing. That's tough. Mm -hmm. So now you put on others, you've cast this umbrella that um, sure it helps bring people into the character, but now they too are adapting to the same strenuous circumstance that you are. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's a, a, a type of camaraderie that's necessary sometimes, I guess. Well, oh, that's, it's, entirely, that's, that's, it's entirely that's possible. Tough. Yeah, that's tough. I, I think so. <laughs> Yeah, wow. So let's talk about a movie that you liked um, that that intensity comes across and that um, body of work comes across as being um, so important yet um, poignant to the film. Well, I would say there's, there, okay, there are two movies that we're going to talk about tonight, but, and we've talked a little bit about the first one, which is Phantom Thread. I don't want to talk about that one right now, though. I would like to talk about A Room with a View. Okay. Um, and, and then after, and then later on, talk about Phantom Thread. So A Room with a View, an entirely different character. And in this one, this movie came out in 1985. It's a Merchant Ivory film. Um, Ishmael Merchant, James Ivory, two of my favorite director producers, and they're known for period pieces and for bringing Ian e. Forster novels to the screen. That's that's kind of like their stock and trade, um, if if they have a stock and trade. Um, but I love some of my favorite movies and movies that they that they have done. And A Room with a View, I remember going to the movies to see this in 1985, I mean, it was considered an art house film. I just thought it was lovely, beautifully filmed. Um, Venice, Tuscany, um, Rome, just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, the costuming was beautiful, but the characterizations were amazing. Um, I, had, I think that's the first time I'd ever seen Helena Bonham Carter. In fact, I think it was her film debut in this movie. Maggie Smith was brilliant in this movie, but you know, when isn't she brilliant? Right. Um, and uh, Judy Dench was in this movie. Wow. Um, you know, and then you have Julian Sand who wasn't known at all to American audiences, but had been, you know, had been relatively well known to British audiences and the, you know, the amazing Denholm Elliott played um, Julian Sand's father. Julian Sand played this character named George and then Denholm Elliott played George's father. Again, another brilliant actor. Daniel Day-Lewis played Cecil Vise, who is a suitor of Lucy, who's played by Helena Bonham Carter. Mm -hmm. And A Room with a View is this period, it's sort of a, what I would call a tone poem and that there's, there is this sort of love 
story, homage to the beauty that is Italy, to the beauty that is a, a simple way of life, to an uncomplicated way of life, and just the magic of having love mm -hmm. in your in in your life. Um, and finding love where it lays, you know, not, not inventing it or exhorting or, you know, whatever, just, you know, letting, letting life be and, and just learning about what life has to offer. And by that way, growing enough to learn how, how to love. Um, so, but there's lovely language in this movie Mm -hmm. um, and you just have these really, you know, kind of interesting characters, you know, Lucy's like very, you know, is conservative, the typical sort of wealthy, well-bred English girl, you know, who plays piano beautifully and who's well-spoken and well-dressed, you know, they, uh, she, like I said, she grows up wealthy, but her brother is kind of a wild guy who um, is a little unruly, but basically, you know, a very good lad at, at heart. And, um, and then you've got, you know, these characters who come together in Italy because Lucy goes off to Italy. And of course, no self-respecting young woman would ever travel alone in the early 20th century, in the early 20th century. She needs a chaperone. That's where Maggie Smith comes in. Mm -hmm. um, and Maggie and Maggie Smith is the aunt is just she's nosy she's you know I think she's secretly jealous at, at her niece because her niece is young and has basically has her whole life ahead of her and and her aunt Maggie Smith is decide most decidedly a spinster and will ever remain so mm -hmm. um, so there's that and um so you've got that and then you've got other people who they come across when they're in Italy and then she meets George who is this you know sort of like very earthy some would say lusty sort of person um I mean he he's well enough off to travel but not rich in the way that Lucy is and somehow they meet and he just knocks down all of her defenses. So she's taken by him, literally, even though he doesn't do anything that's appropriate. Meanwhile, she's already promised she's engaged to Cecil Lies, who's played by Daniel Day-Lewis. And when they, when Lucy comes back to, when Lucy comes back from her vacation in Italy, comes back to England, that's when we see Cecil Weiss. And he's tall and thin and very sort of self-possessed. And he comes across as like an, you know, real, like really conservative, like, like a banker, except that he's not actually, he's, He's very much a liberal, and he even refers to himself as a dilettante, like a professional dilettante. And he says in the movie, because he comes from great wealth, I don't feel any need to have an occupation. I feel as long as I'm not hurting anyone, I can do whatever I want, you know, and I don't need it. I don't need a job. I don't need an occupation. I don't need to pursue anything or learn anything. I just, I simply do what I want when I want which is a pretty bizarre way of looking at the world. It's like, I, I'm a lily of the valley. I toil not, neither do I spin. You're not exactly a lily, dude. You know, you're more of like a, you need a weed whacker is really what's going on here, but still. So, so you have this, so you have this guy and he, what, what's so interesting about this performance is that he, um, Cecil Weiss, as I said, comes across as very stuck up, but he really isn't. He's like this very, very much of a free thinker, um, but very, a very dressed up, trussed up free thinker. But at one point, at some point, Lucy decides, I, you know, I 
not really in love with you. So that's when you see the acting chops that Daniel mm -hmm. Day-Lewis brings to this role. It wasn't a huge role. I mean, it was relatively small. Um, but when she breaks off her engagement with him, this is like halfway through the movie or whatever, the pain is palpable. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though he's not that likable a character, because he's, right. he's very, I mean, he seems to be narcissistic and sort of, you know, just very just self-involved. Well, most narcissists are. So he's narcissistic, meaning he's extremely self-involved and just, you know, completely oblivious to the pain, to the trials and tribulations of other people around him. He's simply, he reads, he smells the fresh air, he shows up for dinner. I mean, that's, that's the world. It's like, uh -huh. he just, you know, that's it. Um, so for somebody like that, it's like, you kind of want them to be hurt, you know, to experience pain just because they're so oblivious to what pain is. Mm -hmm. When he actually does ex experience pain, it's like, oh my God, this actually, I mean, he really hurts. He's really crushed and you really feel for the guy that, that takes some major acting chops. Right. I mean, I yeah. just... You know, it's so, so I just, I loved his performance and I, I loved him at that point. That was 1985. So, I mean, he was barely, he was still in his twenties when he did, when he did that. And the other irony is that A Room with a View and My Beautiful Laundrette were both released on the same day to American audiences wow. in April 1985. So in My Beautiful Andrette, he plays an ex-skinhead who's gay and falls in love with a Pakistani man because we're not breaking any rules there, right? <laughs> so you've got that, that portrayal where he's the star. And then you've got this sort of supporting role where he plays this very effete, some, you know, narcissistic, but, you know, kind of harmless you know, dilettante. Mm -hmm. I mean, two different people, so lower class. Far, right. I mean, two different, you could not get. And this really proved, and because of that happy accident of the US release, that proved to be quite a, a, a advancement, a juggernaut for his career because film critics went absolutely mad. When they saw him in My Beautiful Andrade, and then they saw him in A Room with a View, and they couldn't believe that was the same person. It's like that kind of range, that's amazing. Um, and so he just he became a darling to American to American audiences, or at least to the American film community. You know, with with like it's se seemingly overnight but because of these two films being released at the same time. Wow. A little bit of history there. That's kind of cool. Great for, uh, as you allude to, great for his career. And yep. being, being, uh, being able to be seen by so many and in, in, a, in a very different way. Yeah, I think that would make me go kind of crazy too. I'd be like, wow, what, what? Isn't that that same guy that did that? That's not even close. Right. And but he didn't look the same either. I mean, he kind of had blondish hair in my beautiful laundrette and he, you know, he had very dark hair. Um, I think his natural hair color in, um, in a room with a view. Um, and he sort of, I think he kind of changed the way in which he spoke in my beautiful laundrette to be like lower class British, where he had a very effective way of speaking in a room with a view. That's the deal. That's the deal, Pickle. Yep. So what's one of your films, Greg? Well, here's my thing. I um, American and English literature has fascinated me over time, probably a little bit more in my adult life than in my uh, adolescence or in my teenage years. But one of my favorite authors was James Finnemore Cooper. And the book that wowed me 
as a young man was uh, the last of the Mohicans. And when I found that they were going to do this film, not knowing very much about Daniel Day Lewis at all, but Madeline Stowe, I heard she was going to be in this movie. I've always liked Madeline Stowe as an actress, and she is, plays the lead character uh, opposite Daniel Day Lewis in the film. When I heard the film was coming out, I was excited about the opportunity to see it, the, what my imagination might have seen, and of course, what the um, screenwriter, the director, and the producer's vision was for this film, um, being that James Finn Marcuba basically died in like 1851 or something like that. So I was thinking, wow, this would be great to see this film. And what was the best part about it was I was not at in the least disappointed. Watching Natty Bumpo slash the Deer Slayer slash Hawkeye uh, on film, on screen, Daniel Day Lewis embodied that character for me. Um, we've talked about this on the show before how um, certain actors that you think could portray a role, um, whether that be because of their acting chops or their aesthetic look, that kind of thing. He, what I saw in Hawkeye in my mind was similar to what he portrayed on film, um, the aesthetic. And then to add to that look was his ability to convince me, he convinced me that he had lived in the, on the frontier like all his life. He convinced me that these brothers of his, these Mohican brothers of his were, that they were in sync together, that they were one and that's, important for this film especially because of all the turmoil that is uh, happens in, within the realms of the film. And um, it was just it was just a, a wonderful um, presentation of the character for me. And that made me enjoy it even more after because I had read the, the, the story easily 15 years prior. And yet to see the movie in, I think it came like 1991 or 1992, I believe, when the film, 1992, I think, when the film came out, you know, um, I think a lot of times when we see a film first and then read the book, the book seems to have so much more. And again, not saying that the book didn't and that the book, you know, um, doesn't resonate for other things that the film didn't or wasn't able to you know, facilitate for that time frame, but yet within the time frame and with what it was able to do, I was um, affixed to the screen and I saw it on the big screen first. And um, sitting there with my popcorn and my stubborn, not gonna eat any popcorn until the film actually starts. I know that sounds a little quirky, but that's my quirk. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, you know, and at the middle of the movie, I'm thinking, oh wait, I haven't even started eating my popcorn yet. That's a good sign that it's got my interest. It's a it, very good sign. It is, and it, it got my interest so much that I was already, uh, um, they, they had captured me, they had gotten me to that point. And then of course, making the character interaction be romantic too, in the midst of, all the craziness that was going on. And what I thought was interesting for me and, and a good thing for me in my mind is there's many situations in film where you take those moments for romance to come out um, sometimes very clunky in some certain films and, and, and whether it be on the big screen or small screen. And sometimes in the most inopportune moments and making no sense whatsoever in the film. Obviously, you can tell there's an attraction between characters in many films. And so they don't have to throw a big love scene in the midst of the fact that they're about to get blown up by a bomb or get shot by a machine gun or a plane's about to crash into the building. In this film, it was subtle, yet pronounced. I guess it's kind of an oxymoron, really. Um, because you can tell that there was an attraction. You can tell there was something between them. 
And when that apexed into that moment, it wasn't so huge where they're just all over the place, you know? It didn't do any of that. Mm -hmm. It made you feel like they're on the frontier. They don't have time for this right now. They know that there's something there. Uh, even in the famous quote, I will find you no matter where you go, no matter where you are, I will find you in that quote. That told you right there that there was a, or a some type of uh, 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 attraction and, and relationship, but yet because of what's going on, it made more sense. Like I can't do anything right now. We can't develop this anymore until things are safe. That made more sense then. I will find you, but right now, let's just do this real quick. Then you can go and then I'll find you. And uh, yeah. And what's your name? You know, it was none of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you know, the situation wasn't, didn't present itself like that. I mean, you know, one of the things is if it wasn't for us coming along the road, you'd be dead. And if it wasn't for the, you know, and I think making that feel a little bit more authentic because of the circumstances, especially made that movie even that much more appealing to me and a little bit more rustic like the book was originally. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like the author first and, and the character next and the movie because Daniel Day Lewis made it special for me because he took the time and as we were talking about earlier to put himself into that role and it was, a, it was, it's a really good movie. I've seen it like four times. And he put himself in that world, you know, he did. which is- He did. Why and, he and, was, you know, sharpening knives, sharpening knives and cleaning muskets, you know, in the commissary. Yeah, I mean, he, I mean, and it, and it shows. And it, and it was, and the, the best part about it was not only did it show, but because of it, it was effortless. He did it as if it was just normal, natural mm -hmm. being there, the running, the trapping, the shooting, the paying attention, the lifting of the gun and how he ran with the gun. That looks so authentic to me. And I, obviously I didn't live in the frontier time frame, but history has been a big deal in my family, especially among the men in my family and military history, especially. And so, as I'm watching this and as I'm seeing this and, 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 and enjoying the film, I am also paying attention to how they're doing things, even if it's somewhat subconscious, because I understand the, the parameter and the sh things that are going on. And, you know, Revolutionary War-esque cinematography in the past and all that stuff and up to that present time there's two films that I really enjoy like that, and The Last of Mohicans is one, and The Patriots the other. So, so much detail in the character that it was effortless. It was like, that's who he was. That's who you know him to be. And not taking anything away from his co-stars who were acting with him, you just felt, they felt natural, like that was a, a true brotherhood between those three men. And a true love affair between he and um, Kath, uh, um, uh, uh, Madeline Stowe's character. Um, her too, they pulled that off. They pulled it off. And, and you were so in tune to what was going on and trying to figure out what was going on wasn't hard. They, it, was, it was right in front of you. The, the thing about it is you gotta, you know, jump on for the ride, because it was a ride, you know, in this film. And, you know, every danger around the corner was just right in front of your face. And you knew the danger and the fact that, you know, everyone wasn't going to survive this thing. It was just, it was, it was, it was interesting. I, I, I really enjoyed that movie. I can tell. Yeah. And it was a well done movie. It was a very, very good movie, so. I think so too. So um, my other movie is Lincoln. Um, but before we jump into that, let's get back to your other movie, Karen. 
Um, my, my movie is Phantom Thread, as I mentioned before. Daniel Day-Lewis's last film before his full-length feature film that he announced before um, retiring. He was nominated for Best Actor um, for the, the Academy Awards for the, 20, for the 2017 year. He did not win. Um, now, I will say this, he is the only, he's the one of um, only a few males that have won three Oscars for Best Actor. Um, non, I'm sorry, non-Americans who have won three Oscars for Best Acting. Anthony Hopkins is one, Daniel Day-Lewis is one, and I can't remember the third because... Yeah. I don't know. Be uh, yeah. I was thinking something else. I was thinking, ironically, so it's Sir Anthony Hopkins and it's Sir Daniel Day-Lewis. That's interesting right. in itself. I did right. these guys, because, um, uh, well, I know uh, Anthony Hopkins English, but Daniel Day-Lewis actually has dual citizenship. He's England and Ireland. Right. Right. Um, I wish I could remember that third. Um, <laughs> I wish I could remember that third actor. He's but, probably a British um, actor. <laughs> it, it is the other the oh, other see. the other one is because they're I mean the only actors are British, so um, <laughs> seems like <laughs> our great American right. actors are British, right? Okay, um, huh? And I thought I thought I'd just come across it. Um, He's one of five actors to have won the Academy Award three times in their career. And the other actors were Walter Brennan, Ingrid Bergman, Jack Nicholson, and Meryl Streep. Um, oh. The only person who surpassed them was Katherine Hepburn, who won four Academy Awards. But in terms of like the non, um, uh, oh, I think, okay, then the other one was Jeremy Irons. Oh, of course. Wow. Yeah. And he was the first of three consecutive British actors to win the Oscar for Best Actor in a Leading Role. So he won for My Left Foot in 1989. Jeremy Irons won for Reversal of Fortune in 1990. And then Anthony Hopkins won for Silence of the Lambs in um, 1991. Wow. So, that's, that's, that's awesome. Yes. Yes. Um, all good actors too, like all of them. And he was also the first non-American actor to win three Academy Awards for Best Actor. So there you go. That's, but anyway, so back to Phantom Thread, um, which he didn't win for. But um, this movie, can't say can't say I, I, I really like this movie. I thought this was a really weird movie, and I'm like, I I kind of wish when Daniel Day Lewis announced that he was retiring, I wish he hadn't gone out on this on this particular note or this particular thread, um, because this movie is so weird, it's so strange, and and. And I'm like, even if you're a fan of Daniel Day Lewis, this one's a little hard to take. It's just, it's just, it just seems like one of those movies that you do for your friends and you're not actually trying to communicate with other people. It's just your little, your little joke, your little world. And if you don't get it, it, it you know, it's like the, it's like getting the getting the menu in the restaurant and there are no prices. If you have to ask what the prices are, you can't afford, you know, right. or you have to be this tall to go on this ride. And if you're not this tall, don't even bother asking because you can't go on the ride. Right. That's kind of what Phantom Thread felt like to me. It's like, okay, well, let's just, let's just sort of do a deep dive into this really stuffy, weird world that really no one cares about but let's do this deep dive into this world anyway 
because those of us who really understand how precious and how fragile and valuable this way of life is, we understand. And the other people, who cares about Not them? So much. They can't afford this movie anyway. So, and I guess I'm one of those people who can't afford this movie anyway, because I'm sitting there scratching my head going, what the hell? What is going on with this movie? Um, okay, so let me just tell you what a, on the surface is going on in this movie. We have the House of Woodcock, which is this extremely prestigious fashion design house. Reynolds Woodcock, who is played by Daniel Day Lewis, is the head, is the head designer of the house and owner of the house. His sister, Cyril, who's beautifully played by Leslie Manville, is sort of like, I would, I would say she's the chief financial officer and sort of the, the CEO. So he does designing. She manages all those pesky details that he just can't be bothered with because he needs to design. And the, the Woodcock house is responsible for dressing the richest people in England. And this is in this film takes place in the 50s. So it's a time of debutante balls. It's a time Queen Elizabeth was coronated in 1953. And people who were attending the coronation would go to the House of Woodcock to have their have their dresses or their tuxes designed. So this, this is the clientele he's dealing with pretty heady stuff. Great. And, and there's just, it's almost like a monastery, this world where, you know, you have the, you know, you have the, you know, you have him, he's up in the morning and un, under certain like customary, never to be deviated from circumstances, he starts drawing and then somehow that drawing is, he picks the material, he, you know, directs the, the sewing of the material, the construction of the dress or the tux or the whatever it is. And these women who all dress in white, like lab coats, they all wear lab coats, which I thought was interesting. Everybody wore a lab coat, including the seamstresses, they would sew, so the so construct the garment and then this incredibly wealthy person would appear and gush over how amazing it was and off they would go and then the process would begin all over again it's like well okay that's that's kind of weird and when you when the movie first opens and you see you know there's this obviously this huge house all these people are in the house, but only two people live there, Re Reynolds Woodcock and his sister Cyril. And it's because she looks older than him, it's not apparent that they're brother and sister until later in the movie. At first, when I was watching this movie, I'm like, is that his wife? Or is that his mom? <laughs> or is that his aunt? Or who is this woman? And, and then, it, you know, then it became apparent that they were related. <laughs> And as it turned out, they were brother and sister. It's like, okay, interesting. Um, so, and, and the other part of this movie that I found very weird was that early on in the movie, there's a woman who is eating at the breakfast table with them. And she looks distressed and he's like trying to draw and she's trying to get his attention. And he's like, you know, you're, you're really interrupting me and I can't deal with you right now. And you're, you're making way too much noise. And she's like, but I just need you to pay attention to me. And he's like, yeah, that's so not happening. Cause I'm, I'm drawing right now. It's I'm in church and you know, you're sort of ruining the whole church thing for me. You know, you're singing off key and I don't like my hymns like that, so you need to stop. And 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 then when she, I, I think she storms off or she leaves or whatever, she just can't take it anymore. Um, 
And then he kind of looks at his sister and the sister's like, you know, we need to dump her, you know, and it's like, oh, so they make a joint decision about when it's time for his girlfriend to get going. Odd, but interesting. Okay, we'll just, we'll just let that lie for a minute. So, so he breaks up with her because the, the sister gets the dirty work of telling her, get out. And then, and then, so he goes off to the seashore, I guess for a break. And he's in some little place, not particularly elegant or anything, but just like a little seaside place having a supper. And this waitress comes along to serve him. And of course in the fifties, it's, there's, even though it's not a very luxurious place, things are done with great care. So the food is served with great care. The tea is poured very elegantly. It's like you start pouring and then you bring the, the kettle, you, you bring the teapot up and you have this beautiful stream flowing down and then you bring the, you have the kettle meet the cup again. There's a whole show and I guess, you know, if you don't do it, you can't be British. So you better do all this. So she serves him and he kind of looks at her and she kind of looks at him and, 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 and he's sort of in this really sort of quiet, but almost like prissy way, he sort of like indicates that he's interested in her and she sort of is interested in him. And I'm like, why? <laughs> but, but okay and then he's like you know would you like would you come with me would you just sort of suspend your disbelief enough to come with me to a play to come back with me to my room and she's like um sure because I guess it was evident that it, he wasn't going to ravish her that's not what was on his mind he wanted to try something and he was wondering if she would help him he he put it this way would you help me with something i you know i could really use your help and she said well yes so they go back to his room and he starts trying on these clothes on her and he asked her at every point you know is it a you know would you would you remove your hat is it okay if you take off like your overcoat i would like to put this on you is that okay so he's very you know judicious and very gentlemanly in the way in which he approaches her so she doesn't at all feel you know threatened in any way nor should she he doesn't he doesn't he's not going to harm okay. her at all right. right but so he tries on these dresses you know the these garments on her and he's like hmm you know and he really likes the way they look and blah, 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 blah. And then they, he obviously makes arrangements to see her again and, and they keep seeing each other. And pretty soon she's at the house like all the time. And, and, and so she's there and the sister is like, Cyril's like, I like her. And, and it's like when they first meet, she's looking at her like she's a mannequin. And she's like, you know, the sister is, is looking at Alma, the, the, the woman who becomes his muse is called Alma. Um, and so Cyril's looking at Alma really like she's a mannequin, I'm like, hmm. And then she says, I, I like you, you're perfect. He always likes his women to have a little bit of a tummy. Like, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Flattery will get you nowhere. Yeah, well, pretty much. In, in yeah, we're going nowhere because there will be no <laughs> flattery in this picture. So, and so, yeah, so that's what, so, okay, great. And she just, she just becomes more and more ensconced into their world, into this world. And apparently the waitress job and the house or the family, whatever it was that she left to, we never even, I didn't even know that she had a family she just sort of left wherever she was and just sort of planted herself here. And it got to the point where, you know, she would start introducing herself as his wife, even though they weren't married and nor did he say anything about them getting married. So they have this really weird relationship. And, she, but even though they seem to understand each other, she's his muse. He, he wants her to show off his clothes and, things like that, she starts to become, she starts to chafe under this existence. There's this one point where they're having breakfast and she 
she has a piece of toast. So she takes a knife and she gets a, a little pat of butter and she starts putting it on the toast. Well, the noise of the knife on the toast disturbs Mr. Woodcock. And he says, and he just looks at her and she keeps, you hear this, I mean, it's really, it's really an annoying sound. I was like, it can't really sound like that, but whatever. When you put um, the mic on. <laughs> Right, so Let's she's the mic a little bit more, Harry. <laughs> that's it. That's it. So, okay, hold it, everybody. Cut. Now let's go. Try that again. The Room mic tone. Is down. <laughs> but she, so she, so she's making all this racket just by putting butter on a piece of bread, and he's like, Ugh, "You're really driving me crazy," and she's like. I don't get it. And he's like, you know, I have a process. And my process does not involve you putting butter on my goddamn bread. You really need to either eat the bread or go somewhere else. But you can't, I mean, like genius happening here and you're, you're kind of interfering with the genius. So go away. And she's like, you know, I'm a human being, right? And we make noise all the time. Like we use the bathroom and everything. Or should I not mention that part? So, yeah. So they have this really weird relationship. <laughs> and she starts to chafe. And then she starts doing weird things to get his attention. And I will, there is one thing that she does, which I won't mention. But she does this one thing. And she gets his attention. And they have this really real period of tenderness, of romance or whatever. And, um, and so, and, and they get married. That's not the end of the movie, believe me. But they get married and, um, and then the relationship continues from there. And for a while, things are great, but then they fall into old habits. It's a weird movie. They have the strangest relationship in her her way of sort of resolving the issues that won't go away in this relationship is truly weird. And I'm sitting there watching this movie, literally scratching my head going, what the hell? What kind of relationship is this? Because it's like, if, if you're feeling that, you know, sort of ignored, you, you can leave. You can go back, you still have your apartment, right? Can you just go back to the apartment? Can't, can't you quit him? This isn't like, you know, you're not Heath Ledger. You're not Jason Gyllenhaal or Jake Gyllenhaal. This isn't Brokeback Mountain. You can quit him. But apparently, no, that wasn't in the cards. So she comes up with this weird way of gaining his attention. And I, like I said, I. I'm scratching my head going, what the hell? What kind of movie is this? So was his, and I say all this to say or to pose the question, self, was this, was, was, was his acting good? And I would, and I said, well, self, yes, his acting was quite good. It was, but the person he's playing is not a particularly likable, endearing or even interesting person. I mean, he he designs, he supervises, he sews. All he talks about is his work. All he focuses on is his work. There's nothing else going on. He's not a Renaissance person. He doesn't at all seem to be interested in the world around him except as necessary to restore his passion for doing the only thing that he cares to do, which is design garments. He has like a mini meltdown at one point when um, his sister says, he comes into like his sister's office and she's like, well, I uh, hope you're sitting down. He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you, you, lost, you lost the account. What do you mean I lost the account? Some rich person. Well, this rich person went to this other design house why would they do that? 
well, they mentioned something about you sort of like being old fashioned and, you know, fash style changing. And he's like, well, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. Fashion never changes, you know, it, it's always the same. It's what I dictate. And I'm like, okay, so we've lost any connection to, you know, reality. reality. Right. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, that's interesting. But so yes, his acting, I can see why he was nominated for best actor because he played a truly weird person. But was this, I, I can't go along with this movie being like in my mind, a great movie. I just, I thought it was an extremely niche movie for certain I, I guess for a certain art house crowd, I suppose. Um, he, um, what was I gonna tell you? The director of this movie, let me tell you the director, is someone that he's worked with, is someone that he worked with on quite a few, on not quite a few, cause he doesn't have quite a few. Um, Paul Thomas Anderson was the director but um, Paul Thomas Anderson has done other movies. He did There Will Be Blood. How about that? Mm -hmm. um, he did Magnolia with um, Tom Cruise. And that was a really, I really loved Magnolia. I mean, just bizarre movie. And it was another a bizarre movie. movie. Hmm? I thought Magnolia was kind of a bizarre movie. Yeah, it was. Um, For the Hungry Boy was with Daniel Day-Lewis. Well, that was sort of a, an offshoot of Phantom Thread, but he did that. And there are um, other movies that he's done, but the, probably the most famous is There Will Be Blood. Um, but they, he, maybe the reason that Daniel Day-Lewis decided to retire on this particular project was because he would be working with Paul Thomas Anderson and they really they're like, you know, buds, they, you know, they really um, work well together. Um, so there, there's a trust there. So, um, so, but this, this particular movie, when you read the critical, when you read what people have to say about it critique wise, you've got people who love it or they hate it. Mm -hmm. They're like, this is stupid. It's stultifying. There's nothing going on. This is like my dinner with Andre, except that Andre never actually gets dinner. Not good. Um, or yeah, this is amazing. This is oh the 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 clothing, oh the music, oh you know the cinematography and the period that it evokes, and oh and then the personalities and the sister and the brother and the blah blah. And you know, oh, I rap, I wax rhapsodic. I'm so enthralled. Or this is a bunch of crap, you know. So I don't know. To me, it's like I came a little bit in the middle, but veering toward the, the crap end of the spectrum. Going, I don't know what what I don't know what the purpose of this movie was. Mm -hmm. I don't know what what you're trying to say with this movie. But Vicki Kripes and Leslie Manville and Daniel Day-Lewis did great acting, but I don't know what they were acting for. I get it. I get I get because <laughs> and, and it's almost like sometimes when we see a, a, a good actor in a, in a really bad film mm -hmm. and, and yet we don't really care about the film as much as the acting Within the film of the of the actual actor that we liked, right? And and so we're like, okay, yeah, you know, this was okay film, but uh, they did a really good job, and this is probably one of those films. But even some of those films made a little more sense with the characters that were there and and what was going on in the, in the essence of the film itself. But maybe that's not this movie. Maybe this movie. Is disjointed that way um, to invoke. Oh, I don't know, hysteria on one end. It sounds like and, uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and sheer blue on the other end, and and both of those kind of come to hysteria again. So I don't know. That's that was interesting. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah. Very weird. 
Well, the movie I was talking about to talk about, and I, and I will, I'll be brief, I won't be uh, long-winded on, on this movie in the sense of it depicts a time frame within the realms well, of- Well, before you do that, can I just mention something real quick? Sure. You were talking about The Last of the Mohicans. When he filmed, when he was on the set for that, he learned how to build a canoe. He learned how to track and skin animals. And along with perfecting the use of a 12 pound flintlock gun, which right. he took everywhere he went, even to a Christmas dinner. I'm just saying. Well, here's the thing about that. Because of how heavy it was, you needed to kind of carry it around so that it would be so effortless like it was in the film. But you see him carrying this gun and these guys carrying these guns and moving along you know, the, the, the river beds and through the trees and all this stuff. And you're thinking, man, it's cool to be a hunter in that day and age with these mm -hmm. guys. Now, the other conflict, war and all that stuff, and you know, yeah, all that stuff is, is uh, just made their lives, put their lives in turmoil. But even within the realms of that, just the pure respect that they have for each other, it's just great. But yeah, I can see him doing that. Um, yeah, especially from what uh, you uh, presented about his persona when it comes to um, trying to become the character. Yeah, he truly was doing it. So that's, but, but isn't that kind of cool though? I think, I that's think, I mean, cool. it, it may be a little excessive, but it was really kind of cool because, you know, now he understands what it takes to have lived in that time, mm -hmm. doing those kinds of things as opposed to, um, cut, okay, let's get Ben Zahara to come in here. Now, Ben, uh, Jim's hairline is like like this. So you're gonna have to do this when you bend down so they can't see your face because you're the double. Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, I don't want to do this. Cut, Ben Zahara, <laughs> and come over here. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, Ben, you're gonna turn your head this way, like, no, I don't, no, and then, you know, but it's going to be from the back, so you know we won't see his face because that, well, you know, that would just destroy the movie for everyone knowing that it's really not Kirk Douglas as Ben Zahara. So yeah, and not Kirk Douglas because he did his stuff too. But anyway, <laughs> you know, yeah, right, you know, right, from, from one rugged guy to another rugged guy, right? Um, so Lincoln, um, one of my favorite films. One of my favorite films. Lincoln depicts a time frame when the battle is raging so close to the end and it's at its worst. And this is prior to the emancipation of slaves. And what's depicted in the film is the struggle that Lincoln is going through with regard to the nation, with regard to the carnage, with regard to even infighting within his own cabinet <laughs> with regard to all these different things that are happening around him. Um, talking about re-election, I mean, it's just everything is going on in this very short period of time. And Daniel Day Lewis, aesthetically, it's like he looked at pictures of Lincoln and just like slept with them right next to his bed so that he would feel the osmosis essence of Lincoln <laughs> creeping upon his face as he turned the pillow. And his face would be, you know, whatever makeup detail helped in the, in the evolution of Abraham Lincoln through Daniel Day-Lewis, it was superb. I've seen a lot of pictures next to Daniel Day-Lewis as he, has moved his head in certain sequences to see where pictures have been taken of Lincoln. And it's like, it's uncanny. Now, obviously he's not gonna look exactly like Lincoln, but he sure looked like he was like Lincoln's twin or older, a year older, a year younger, maybe a twin, tall, you know, he looks so much like Lincoln that he could have been in the family. Mm -hmm. That's amazing in itself. There are a lot yep. of different actors who have given you that visual um, uh, uh, essence of the character. I think 
Halle Berry did in Dorothy Dandridge. I think Jamie Foxx did in Ray. Yeah. And I think Daniel Day Lewis did in Lincoln. They encompass the embodiment and the aesthetic embodiment, especially of these particular people. Now, obviously, you're talking about the 1800s, so there's no way that we would have necessarily all the essence of how Lincoln might have sounded. But when you hear Daniel Day Lewis portray this character, when you watch him on screen, you're not thinking about is he is that that, that authentic? You're just thinking it is. You think right. you're watching Lincoln in his best moments and his vulnerable moments, in him trying to figure things out, and you feel the humanity of it. And that's what I really enjoyed about this film. It felt the humanity of a person being a person within the realms of trying to be a president during wartime and being on the battlefield, seeing the carnage. Now, there are a lot of presidents have may have gone and visited different army bases and things like that, but they were not on the near the front line like Lincoln was. And you're walking, you know, on a horse riding through troops who are wounded, dying, getting off trying to talk to people, all this stuff while this war is rage, raging. That in itself is a horrific thing to see, especially as a president whose main purpose really is to unify the, com the country. And another thing about a lot of the presidents that we've had over time, it wasn't trying to put together a country. It's the country that's at turmoil, not fighting an enemy that's a foreign enemy. You're fighting brothers and sisters and cousins and uncles and, and who have a difference of opinion and or feel that what they feel that they would be fighting for is not being respected on either side of the, of, of the Union and the Confederacy. And that's a sad continence in the world where you're, you could literally be across the way and see your cousin on the other end. Mm -hmm. Literally see your cousin or, or even your brother who just, you all fell out because you didn't agree. That is a horrific existence. And then you're the president who's trying to find a way to get them to stop fighting, put their grievances aside and unify the nation. And unfortunately in a civil war, the only way to unify the nation is to win. And what is the essence of winning is not always a positive thing. Um, it makes things even that much more difficult because now you've got to find a way to embrace your brother who hates you. So, and then do things that are just not necessarily popular, but necessary. You know, the emancipation of slaves wasn't necessarily done to be a good to slavery. It was done to be a good to the economy. And, you know, to also find a way to help uh, assert a little bit more leverage to winning this war, this civil uh, uh, combat. And to watch Daniel Day-Lewis do this and those moments of insanity make you feel like it, Lincoln had to be going through all this because all the things that were going on just were too horrific and too, uh, so much pressure. So many things that he and people of that time frame had to deal with in the sense of, you know, um, and then trying, you, you believe in, as you watch it, him trying to do the right thing always trying to do the right thing and not necessarily doing that all the time because he was human. He put a very, very humanistic feel to a president that we know very little about truthfully. But yet at the same time, he made you feel compassionate for the pressure and the, the anxiety and the sheer trying to be the right 
president for all these people and not necessarily the most popular, especially during wartime. This was a, prof a profound performance to me. The rest of the movie uh, alongside him was good. Mm -hmm. and even the other characters were believable. It's a star studded cast in this film. James Spader was, I love James Spader in this movie playing the, um, the sort of Yankee leaning lobbyist who just personify pure evil to me. Uh, w in oh. something, W in, W in what was it? W in something. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and then Sally Field playing Mary w in, Todd. W, w in Bilbo. Right, and then Sally Field playing Mary Todd Lincoln. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, and she had to fight to get that role, you know, she really, because they were like, you're too old. I'm like, what? In the first place, she can act her, she's got more acting chops in her little finger than most of the so-called younger actresses that you're looking at could have in several bodies. And in the second place, she's not playing a young woman. Mary Todd Lincoln right. was older than Lincoln when they got married. Significant, I mean, like, I want to say like five or 10 years older, maybe. So yeah, she can be older. But anyway, she, she managed, she somehow the right thing prevailed and she managed to get that part and she acted the hell out of that part, which is why she was nominated. I can't remember if she won the Best Supporting Actri oh, um, no. Actress Oscar, but she sure as hell was nominated. Sally Field is a stellar actress. I always thought that. Um, I always liked her small screen stuff, even with, all the way back to Sister Patrill and the Flying Nun. So yeah, yes. <laughs> I've been a Sally Field fan, right? Me too. Uh, even even uh, even uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt um, as Lincoln's brother. Um, not as huge role, but a poignant one. And I, mm -hmm. I, again, I mean, there's just so many actors in this film. So uh, I'm not going to try to mention all of them because it would just, it would take well, a long it's a time. Huge, huge film. Yeah, it would take a long time. But the bottom line is, I think for me, uh, for this film, is that um, all the trouble and or um, research and uh, all the embodiment of being the, the character, the best Lincoln out there. Um, I enjoyed that um, in this film. And it's funny, I think there's another actor, there's, there's a few actors in here that actually played Lincoln. Um, <laughs> I'm, well, pretty, I'm pretty but, sure. But the only one, the well, Henry Fonda played Lincoln, he played young didn't Lincoln. Hal, didn't Hal Holbrook play Lincoln once too? Hal Holbrook in a television, television yeah. vehicle, but not not in the movies. But Henry Fonda did it in a wide release, um, in a wide release version. Young as a young like Lincoln. young yeah. Abe Lincoln in Illinois, yeah. or said his name something like that. Which he was wasn't decent. nominated. No, it hmm? was decent. He wasn't, but it was a decent movie. It was decent, yes. Um, but then Raymond Massey, he was the one who got acclaim for his portrayal of Abraham Lincoln. And I think it, the movie was just, um, I can't remember what it was called. Um, um, hmm. But he was, he was in a, he was, he was in a, you know, Lincoln vehicle. And I want to say, was it just, it wasn't called Lincoln. Was it called Mr. Lincoln? Um, Abe Lincoln in Illinois. There you go. Oh, okay. So yes. And he, he was nominated. He was nominated for best actor but he didn't win. Daniel Day Lewis did win. But those two performances, Raymond Massey and Daniel Day Lewis, are the only ones that were ever nominated for acting awards in terms of movies. Mm -hmm. But well, bottom, bottom, um, I don't know. 
for lack of a better way of saying it, I enjoyed this Lincoln. I loved it too because I mean the the virtue of having a modernist take on this is that you don't you don't try to sugarcoat things like Abe Lincoln Illinois if it suffered at all as a film it was this stylized heroic portrayal of this man in in sort of these you know homogenous circumstances you know it's like Abe Lincoln was good because he was against slavery and he was fighting to keep, you know, to, to keep slavery from taking over the country. He was fighting for the soul of the country. And that was pretty much the whole drumbeat of Abe Lincoln in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And and he was sort of presented as this, you know, this great thinker who, you know, was this egalitarian and 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 all of this other stuff. And in Steven Spielberg's Lincoln, you get a much more rounded portrayal of the actual man. I mean, he was a he was a thinker, but he was also a man of his time. He was definitely a racist. He said in no uncertain terms on more than one occasion that he believed in white supremacy. And he didn't just say that to Molly Coddle, the, the Southerners. He said that because he believed it. Mm -hmm. um, he thought for sure, you know, the races should be separate and that the and whites were superior to blacks. He just didn't like the whole slavery thing that made, you know, that was that was kind of a deal breaker for him, thank goodness. But mm -hmm. but, you know, anything else in which black people would be considered and, and treated as inferior, he was fine with. So mm -hmm. not a per not a perfect man. He also, you know, dealt with just backbreaking drama in his personal life at the time that the civil war was going on he had a child die you right. know another another child was sick one was in the one was in the arm or one was serving in the army mary todd lincoln was was you know sick so much of the time and so you had all that and then you're trying to keep the country from falling apart too <laughs> so right. Right. His courage, I mean, he showed a great deal of courage and fortitude, but that didn't make him perfect. Didn't right. always make him likable. That He wasn't always heroic every single minute of the day. I mean, the man was human. He put on his pants one leg at a time, like all the other men did. So yeah. he had issues. And I think, and, and he was also a politician. And, and, you know, so many treatments of Lincoln just sort of gloss over this whole, they act as if somehow he was above politics. He was not above politics. He got down and dirty with the best of them. That's where he came up with all those quotes from. Right, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and whatever the essence of his being a lawyer and all that stuff, he, he's groveling, groveling down to the nitty gritty with all these people all the time. Constant fighting, that's probably a, 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 a positive for him. Uh, going verbal wordplay, verbal yeah. you know debates. That's how he beat um, Douglas, Stephen Douglas. So yeah, I mean the man, the man's a politician. He knew how to schmooze. He knew how to charm people. And if people made fun of him, he knew what to own and what not to own. Like you know, he he grew the beard when you know Logo suggested. Well, you might not. You know, people are like you're ugly and and. And then the little girl's like, well, gee, you know, maybe if you grow a beard, that could help. And she's like, okay, fine, I'll grow a beard. And and people stopped making fun, you know. And he was really, really tall, like, un, you know, like sort of freakishly tall. Right, especially so for that, the time frame, for the era. Especially yeah. for the time frame, but even today, by today's standards, very, very tall. So, you know, so, you know, so there's that and, and, um, it just it dealing with all of these different personalities and he didn't pick the best people in his cabinet. He had lots of trouble with the people who are supposed to have his back, right. didn't have his back. And somebody who wasn't supposed to have his back, who's kind of an also ran Ulysses S. Grant proved to be one of the greatest appointments he ever made. And if he, if he hadn't made Ulysses S. Grant general, we probably would have lost the Civil War. I mean, it's it's possible. Grant was possible. that good. 
Um, but, you know, Lincoln, I mean, he, I think he liked Grant, but Grant brought baggage too. So it wasn't like a slam dunk. Right, right. Right. And, and with all that, and all the politicking, um, posturing, <laughs> he's, I mean, he's dealing with all kind of crap. I mean, it's amazing the guy just didn't go crazy. Um, so I get that too. But yeah, um, again, a pretty stellar film. Um, yeah, just the whole film was great. I, you know, it deserved best picture. It deserved the best picture Oscar that it got. I believe Spielberg got best director. He deserved that. Mm -hmm. Daniel Day Lewis definitely deserved best actor for his role. Um, it just, um, you know, and and everything, the cinematography, the um, the writing was so well done. Yeah, I, 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 it was, it was a sad, it was sad to watch all the things that were going on. And I guess the pleasure of the movie was, again, how authentic it felt. Mm -hmm. um, and his portrayal felt authentic. And I, I, I appreciated that in the, in the film. So, well, um, not to be a dead horse any deader as uh, <laughs> the new quote that we have, beating a head, dead horse any deader. Um, so Daniel Day-Lewis, good actor, great actor, will be missed uh, definitely by this film critic. And uh, yeah, I but, think he's definitely more than a good actor. He, he is yeah. probably one of our finest actors. Indeed, indeed. Well, Karen, um, Anything else you want to add to this before we get out of here? Well, I wanted to just mention what um, what awards, um, oh God, what awards um, Lincoln won, if I could just get to it real quick. Um, okay, awards, here we go. Okay, um, I may have overstated the number of Oscars. Okay, so the film won two Oscars and everything else, it was nominated. So it, Daniel Day-Lewis won for Best Actor, Rick Carter won for Best Achievement in Production Design, J Rick Carter and Jim Erickson, I'm sorry. But then it did not win it was nominated, but did not win as best motion picture. Tommy Lee Jones was nominated, but did not win for best supporting actor. Sally Field nominated, was nominated, but did not win for best supporting actress. Steven Spielberg was nominated, but did not win for best achievement in directing. Tony Kushner was nominated, but did not win for best writing adapted screenplay. Janusz Kaminski was nominated, but didn't win for Best Achievement in Cinematography. So, and there were numerous other awards. I mean, the film was nominated like crazy, but only it only won two awards, Best Supporting Actor and Best Production Design. Well, Best Actor. I, I'm sorry, I meant to say Best Actor and then Best Production Design. Those are the only two awards that film won. Yeah, we know about films winning certain awards and not winning others, and it doesn't seem to make sense. But as they say in California, if it don't make money, it don't make sense. So, you know, I'm just kidding. I don't know. I just really didn't apply it, but you know. <laughs> All right. Well, Daniel Day Lewis, we salute you. We'll miss you. Um, but fortunately, we have you on film to go back and see again and again and again. I know I'll be able to to see my two favorite films by him, um, The Last Mohicans, I'll probably see that again in the near future, and Lincoln in the near future. Uh, I actually was waiting for a little while to get, let Lincoln get kind of out of my mind so I could watch it again. So um, that time is coming soon. So until we meet again, ladies and gentlemen, 
Darren and I are out of here. Thanks for watching us here on A Real Point of View. Please check out our archives on either Blog Talk Radio or Google uh, Podcasts, as well as our YouTube channel, uh, A Real Point of View. Um, thank you again for joining us here, and we will try to come back with some more thought-provoking real movies, real time. All right, everybody, have a good night. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.